Hello, product people. Welcome to the Product for Product podcast, hosted by Matt Green, data advocate and product manager, and Masha Mikanovsky, product leader and author. Our goal is to serve the product community by helping you find products that can help make your work in product management easier. Thanks for joining us on another episode of the Product for Product podcast. Welcome back on today's episode. Mache and I are excited to speak with founder, author, and speaker, Orly Zewi, about branding for startups. So let's hop in. How are you, Orly? Good morning. How are you? Thanks so much for having me on the show. Doing wonderful. Hey, Mache. Hey, Matt. Hey, Orly. Welcome to the show. Uh, very excited to have you here. Thank you. And Happy New Year. Yeah, Happy yes. New Year, 2024, right? Yes, I know. Uh, we, um, I think you might have been the last, no, probably I met a few other people after you, but one of the last new people I met in 2023. And uh, one of the things that stood up to me when we met was how passionate you are about naming things. Mm-hmm. You know, whether it is naming people, like your own identity, or naming a company. And I was like... We need to talk with Orly about naming a product because that's always <laughs> something that... It's a big deal, right? It's a big deal for our product people and for companies in general, right? Yep. But before that, let's uh, introduce yourself. Tell us who you are, where you're from, and how did you get to where you are? Oh, that's a story. <laughs> <laughs> let's go for it. Yes. <laughs> we love stories. Yeah. Yes. So... um so, you know, my, my, so I always say, I basically, what I say is I'm multicultural, multilingual, because that kind of, that kind of wraps up everything. But I, I was born in Israel, but I grew up in Paris and in Lausanne, Switzerland, before my family immigrated to the States. Um, so English is actually my third language. And I think that all of that moving and getting used to different cultures and different languages was really like the perfect training ground for doing the work that I do. Because what I do is I help um, I help companies clarify and communicate their zone of genius so they can attract more of their ideal clients. Mm. And that clarification process really came from an understanding of, you know, really reading between the lines and being able to understand what people are saying, even when they're not speaking or when mm. they're speaking a language you don't understand. You know, people are people no matter where you are. And I found it really fascinating looking back, um, you know, thinking about how how well I learned how to read people because I had to. I didn't have a choice. I didn't know the language. When we came to the States, I didn't speak a word of English. Mm-hmm. Wow. Yeah, I learned wow. it. I uh, actually learned it in three months. Mm-hmm. <laughs> oh, impressive. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was 11. You, so. Okay, you had, yeah. Plus, you kind of have to, right? You kind of, you, you know. I kind of do. Yeah, I mean, you know, unless you go to an international school. Yeah. But my parents are very old school. You know, throw you in the deep <laughs> end and you figure That's out. That's right. Yeah. And um, it's always amazing to see how kids learn languages so fast. But yeah. something you said over there about the, another skill that you learn while you were doing this is reading people. Mm-hmm. So, yep. so you had to sharpen that even without knowing that you were doing this, right? Yeah. 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 And, and I would say, you know, one of the, so age seven is when the, when the receptors close. So when you're born, and I've actually done quite a bit of study about this, because when I had kids, I wanted them to also speak French, which, which they, they know a few words, but um, sadly, <laughs> they are not bilingual. <laughs> we should but, move to Montreal, you know. Yeah. Well, that's <laughs> Exactly. Um, So, but what I learned is that uh, up till the age of seven, all of those receptors are open. And what's Mm. fascinating to me is the way babies learn language. Babies are open to all languages, right? But what happens is they start to respond to the positive cues they get from their parents when they get the word right. And little by little, they are, it's like they get channeled into their, the language Mm -hmm. of their family. Mm -hmm. And if you don't have access or if you don't, are not exposed to different languages um, up to the age of seven. It's much harder after that. So I grew up listening to six to seven languages on a daily basis because both my parents are multilingual. And um, and so based on how, what language they spoke, I knew who they were talking to on the phone. Right. Uh, that's fascinating. That, that's an argument for teaching children languages earlier in life. I know yeah. I didn't start to hear another language till high school. Yes, uh, and so it's too late. Yeah, then. it's too late by then. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's why people say why well, I learned Spanish 
in high school, which actually I did. Um, yeah, I, me too. I, I don't remember anything, but <laughs> the reason I do is because I had been hearing it all along, not Spanish, right. but, you know, different languages. Other languages, yeah. So, Absolutely. But, is yeah. It, it this this um, being receptive to other people to understand them without understanding what they're saying, is that something that you can teach others? Hmm. Well, that's such an interesting question. I've never been asked that before. Um, Always first time. There yeah. you go. Um, <laughs> you know, I think so. But here's the thing. In order to do that, you have to stop talking. <laughs> mm. True. Also, right? And most people, as you know, when there's a conversation, they're just waiting for the moment where they can jump in. Which is why, you know, when I was I was trained in design thinking, I went back to school, I got an MBA, and I, I learned uh, that whole process of design thinking. And and the first step is empathic listening. And that's because if you don't un if you can't relate to the person, you can't solve their problem. And I think the same is true when you're learning about somebody. If you just stop talking and just ask open-ended questions, this is the key, right? Ask open-ended questions. Because if you ask yes, no questions, you don't really learn that much. Mm -hmm. But you also have to then stop and really listen. And then, you know, instead of jumping in with your opinion, you know, ask clarifying questions. That's also part of the design thinking process. Ask right. clarifying questions. And then and then there's the yes and, you know, response always kind of keep keep it going and not have it be you know not not that it's adversarial but you mm -hmm. know really focus more on i'm curious and i want to learn mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah so this is where the the importance of active listening uh, moshe and i had a conversation recently about this so definitely parallels with that conversation and product managers when we're trying to listen to customers we need to actively listen to what they're saying to identify the problems and maybe even what they're not saying so like the non-verbal cues that we might get from customers. Right. And also they have to be in the right environment where they feel safe to tell you their opinion. Mm -hmm. So, you know, one of the the things that I, so I do a lot of um, uh, uh, retreats and workshops. And when I get people in a room, one of the things I always do is I make sure I, I get information. Um, there's a whole process, but before the, before the workshop and the responses are, are always, they're never attached to a name so people don't have to worry but it's really hard to do this in a room where your boss is it you know it really comes down to are you looking to learn or are you looking to to have people validate what you believe <laughs> and I think <laughs> there's right. a lot of that going on which is part of why you know we don't approach it from a curiosity perspective but more from a perspective of you know I'm right, and I want, and I want, I want people to validate that what I'm saying is right. Mm -hmm. Confirmation. Confirmation bias. There you go. That's right. Right. Yep. Right. Yep. Right. Absolutely. So going back into, you know, so you got to what you're doing today, and and let's dive a bit more into that before we get into naming. Yeah. But um, think about how do we get into naming because that's really what I'm interested in today. Uh, but in general, you know, you work with a startup. How do you help them? So first of all, you know, I do want to say one other thing about this. I It took me a while to realize why I am so passionate about startups. So I come from a long line of entrepreneurs on my father's side. And mm -hmm. I grew up, my father was an inventor and uh, entrepreneur and uh, struggled a lot. Yeah, in in his uh, in trying to really establish himself, and and that stuck with me. And I think you know, for me, working with startups, when I help them, I feel like I'm also helping the family, and um, and so it's it's also personal, you know, for me. Mm. Um, in terms of how I help them, you know, one of the things I've learned, and I, you know, I say I just I always say this to my clients too, you know, find your lane and stay in your lane. So my lane is I make fuzzy clear. That's really it. That's what I do. Um, and that's important because if I don't understand who I am as a brand, I can't really market it because you can't sell something that you yourself don't understand. So clarity is absolutely critical. And then you need to be able to communicate in such a way that people get it, they want it, they value it, they're willing to pay a premium for it. And the problem is that so often, um, you know, people just want to throw information out there and hope that somehow something sticks, you know, but 
we're being messaged at a rate of roughly 12,000 messages a day, which is actually more than 4 million a year. And that's on the low end. Um, mm. Just to give you perspective, in 1985, that number was 1,500 a day. So, you know, it's like over a thousand percent increase because of the internet, because yeah. of social media, because you all those. And so what people don't realize is that I don't have time to figure out who you are. So you're asking me to buy something. I don't even know who you are, what you do, why it matters to me. And what people tend to do is they tend to speak from their perspective. But when you're selling something or when you're trying to engage somebody, you're not engaging yourself. You're engaging people who don't know what this is. They haven't really understood the value of it. And so focusing on the why, <clears throat> as in why it matters to that ideal client, is another huge part of this. Oh, there's so much there that resonates with me. Well, I'm happy to hear that because I've spent my entire career in that space. So I'm happy to hear it. <laughs> I'm sure, well, I'm I sure just, you're hearing it quite a lot. I go back to all the noise. Like you're like to your point of the noise. Like um oh. <laughs> like you have to get to the point as quickly as possible. You know, people's attention spans are dropping, you know, astronomically. And if you Actually, if you don't catch them right away. Yeah. Actually I, I have the stat on that. So in two thousand uh, the average American, uh, you know, I'm just using Americans, so sorry for the bias there, but the average American adult's attention span in 2000 was 12 seconds. Now it's hovering somewhere around eight seconds. Oh, and no. I read somewhere, I don't know if this is true, but the average goldfish attention span is nine seconds. Oh, gosh. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> it feels true. I don't know if it is true. It does but feel it a bit true. It feels true. Oh, but, no. and, oh, no. Of course, when I... <laughs> And when I land on your homepage, you got you got six seconds before I make a go no go decision. Mm -hmm. Right. So when right. you put all this stuff on your homepage, that's all about that's internally focused, all about you, how great you are, your expertise, and then you're immediately selling me, sign up, you know, buy this, you know, book this. It's like I don't even know why I'm here. I don't even <laughs> know what this is, right? So. There's also this kind of educational component of how people access information. And mm. it's not by telling me everything up front, it's helping me discover. Right. So do you have a method that you use when you help uh, your clients or is that your secret sauce? Or <laughs> I'm sure your secret sauce is you because everyone is doing it different and it's also about the relationship and, and people can actually work with you. But, um, you know, can you share with us a bit about that? Oh, yeah, absolutely. So so the first step, like, you know, basically I break it down into two things, into two parts. The first part is the brand strategy. Who am I? What's my core value? Um, you know, coming up with the, you know, the first, the first round of an elevator pitch. But it's really getting, you know, there's a very clear path to that and that so that whole process is exercises i do both you know i'll send it i'll send it to them ahead of time um and then we do it on, uh, on virtually we'll we'll then get to the the clear piece which is if i don't understand your core value and by that i mean what is the thing that is in the dna of your brand and everybody knows what it is instinctually but they think oh we're going to have all these other values right but those are just how you do business um, mm -hmm. And then the second part is, who are they, right? So I understand who I am now. I understand who they are, meaning my ideal clients, not just everybody on the planet who could use what I do, but the people for whom this would be a lifesaver. This would be something that would help them sleep better at night. So I have a, a whole process around that. There's another exercise. And then from that, I develop key messages. And then from the key messages, we break that down into the the messages that are going to um, that are really going to inform your website. So you know, I look at a website as you know, I I step into you know, uh, I through the front door, which is your homepage, right? Your homepage mm -hmm. is your front door. I want to know why am I here and why should I care? That's it. But I, the other stuff, I can go dig in and look for more stuff. What people tend to do again is they think, oh, I'm just going to put everything on here because I don't want to forget anything or I want people to know everything. And that's just not how we access information. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and so, and so then um, once I have that, then, you know, we, I, I put together what I call kind of a cheat sheet, which is how you go about 
having a conversation when you meet someone who looks like they might be your ideal client. And by the way, um, I also help you develop an elevator pitch, which in fact will help you identify that ideal client. Because if it doesn't resonate, when I say, for instance, when I say I make fuzzy clear, if that doesn't resonate with you, then there's nothing more to say because my ideal client will hear that and go, oh my God, how do you do that? I've been struggling for years to do that. Right. Tell me more, right? That's what you want people to say, tell me more. So what I also build is kind of a, a ladder, um, you know, of how do I get to the conversation where we can begin to have a talk about what I can, how I can help you. But before we get to that, I need to understand, is this the right person? do they align with the thing that I've established, I've identified is really my why? Mm -hmm. The understanding of who our clients are and making sure that we don't waste our time on someone that exactly. is not even going to be the right client. Yeah, why chase after somebody who's never going to be a client? You know, but, but people can <clears throat> come at it from the other perspective, which is, well, I'll just throw all this stuff out there and somehow I'll attract you know, uh, throwing out a net already guess it. <laughs> This is actually yeah. a very, a very important message to product people and to companies in general, because a, lo a lot of the tension that sometimes is created is between product and sales, yeah. where sales don't understand who the product is for, or they have ideas in their head that it can fit other type of clients without actually making sure that product will, um, you know, agree with that and not just agree because they agree but agree because that's the right thing to do with the product and the right focus for the company and then they go after these clients and sometimes they will be successful selling them and then product have to fit the the uh, product to <laughs> to that client which is always a disaster yeah you know that's such an interesting point uh which is why you know so i'm sure you're familiar with uh steve blank and uh the lean startup, um, you know, he's the, the grandfather of, of, of that, of uh, this whole concept. Mm -hmm. And, you know, one of the things is that, you know, you have to be able to really understand the problem you are solving. Otherwise you're just a solution looking for a problem. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. I, was think, I was thinking the, uh, the movie uh, Wolf of Wall Street where uh -huh. Leonardo DiCaprio's character asked the guy at the table to sell him a pen. And I was thinking, he tries to sell the pen to Leonardo DiCaprio, but if, if Leonardo DiCaprio worked on a computer, he wouldn't care about the pen, but he could have talked to the, the server who takes the order and writes it down. That would be the pitch. You're like, why would I just talk to the, the person that actually needs it? Mm -hmm. and, and you know instantly whether it's going gonna, it's gonna to stick or not at and that then, point, very quickly. You're actually bringing up another really good point, which is users and buyers. So a lot of times you know, you're selling something, it's not to the user, but it's the people who are going to pay for this. Mm -hmm. And then, so you have to be thinking about how is a user going to um, access this and how is it going to help them? But this, this, uh, this process of really understanding what matters to your ideal customer is, is really uh, critical because it gets to what's in their space, what's in their world. And also, you know, what is the pain? What is the thing that is really at the heart? And it's rarely what you think it is, right? Because once we do this exercise, we discover that it's something altogether different than it's not just, I need a pen. I, you know, I need to be somebody that people respect or people look at and say, this is a go-to person in the company or, you know, what, you know, there's also usually there's a personal brand in there that's wrapped up in, in the decision. Um, but then there's also the other piece is what do I get? What do I gain? Well, how, how does what you do help me? Because if you're not mm -hmm. helping me, then why would I buy from you, right? I need mm -hmm. to know that that you understand my problem, you've got my back, you've got a solution, and that working with you is going to help what is motivating me as well. You mentioned personal brand. So if you're an early stage startup or a founder of one or something like that, like tying your personal brand and your startup brand, that those need to be in sync as well. Um, well, they're the same thing in the beginning. Yeah. And, yeah. And, you know, I'm always fascinated by this idea of, you know, building a culture. The culture starts with the founder. So if you haven't, if you can figure out 
you know, what your secret sauce is, what your zone of genius is and what, you know, kind of how to communicate, you know, this core value, then you build a culture based on that value. And it's easier than to find the people who are aligned with that. You know, the, there are the, during the research for my book, one of the things that I discovered is that, you know, the number, um, the number three reason that startups fail is they have the wrong team. Mm -hmm. uh, the number one reason is no market need. And not surprisingly, number two reason is they run out of cash. <laughs> <laughs> the team itself, making sure you have the people there that understand the, the why of what you're trying to solve for the customers that you're trying to solve that for. Right. And the, the ultimate mission and vision of the company. Because they're going to be your brand ambassadors. So if yes. they don't get it, if they're not like, they need to be, you know, in the beginning, it's really about this alignment is so important because if they're not, if they don't get it, if they feel like it's not a fit, um, first of all, they're not going to stay. Second of all, they're not going to be able to speak to your brand um externally and and you know as we know people people speak both at positive and negative so you want people really aligned absolutely who are going to say the, the right message out there absolutely so in in a previous uh, episode we talked with uh Tuvit uh you know Tuvit yeah. I believe from um Founder Institute in Philadelphia right yeah. and and with her we spoke about how to craft the story of the product and uh, because of your and we 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 touched about that also in this discussion about the story and how do you tell your story right but uh with you i wanted to dive a bit into the naming of the product because that's something you're you're quite passionate about and i can see that from everything that you were talking about you were really looking into that essence and that essence it's almost like a, a perfume like you're finding like this Two, three words, one or, or you know, maybe up to three. I don't know if three is too much for a name of a product already. But you find this name that will really, just by saying the name, people will already kind of get it. Um, I, I, that's how I see it. But maybe I'm wrong about that, right? So, yeah. so tell us, first of all, how do you see a name of, and think about the product. I know that it also resonates. Sometimes many companies will have the same name as a product as the company. Sometimes you will have a company name with many uh product names, but let, let's just think about the product first. Okay. So, so first of all, you know, we've already talked about this, uh, the importance of getting clear. So remember that the name is the identity of your brand. Your logo is shorthand for your brand. So the first step, you know, people come up with a logo before they've even figured out the name. I, one of the things I always tell my clients, you know, startup clients is, Forget about the logo for right now. Let's focus on the name because you can't have a logo that represents the wrong name. And if you have the wrong name, you can't really build from there anyhow. So um, so what you need to do is once you really understand what's, you know, think of it like a package, right? You know what's inside the box. Um, the logo is the bowl, but the 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 name is the shape of the box right and and i look at this and i get it i get something really core about what this is and you know um i've already you know there's this idea this is you know one of the things i i did in my book is i unpacked all these marketing myths and one of them is oh people buy in spite of our name like almost like the name doesn't matter and that is not true which is why i use nike as an example um i i don't know if you know what nike's original name was I vaguely remember, but yeah, go ahead and explain it. Yeah. Well, the reason I use them for, as an example, they had that name for 10 years and they were never able to grow to the where they are today, right? So I don't remember the exact numbers, but it was, you know, first of all, completely forgettable. Remember that the company was started by three athletes, right? And so the name was Blue Ribbon Sports. Think mm -hmm. about that. Makes sense if you're thinking in terms of a prize, right? But blue ribbons are typically in county fairs. Charlotte's Web. I was yeah. thinking Charlotte. <laughs> right. Yeah, the, the, pig, the biggest pig. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The exactly. pig, yep. And so they had that name for 10 years and they never grew to, I think they were at like maybe $10 million at that point, mm. um, which sounds like a lot, but, you know, I mean, they're like in the billions now. Where they are now, Yeah. <laughs> So they hired this guy, Scott Bedberry, who um, basically, you know, went on this, this, he called it the big dig to really figure out what was this thing, right? What was it? And ultimately, 
you know, because we're talking about products, I don't know if you know this, but Nike was the name of their breakout waffle shoe. And it's the perfect name because Nike is the goddess of victory. So ancient uh, Greeks, you know, they they uh, prayed to the goddess victory before they went into battle. I mean, what better name for a yeah. company that, you know, uh, um, clothes and puts shoes on of Olympic athletes? Right. Mm -hmm. And as soon as within like a year, I mean, it's like the name really helped explode the company because it now said something that people could grab onto. Plus, you're right, Moshe, that you know, blue ribbon sport, like it does not roll off the tongue. So I actually have, when we get to this, I've got like here, the, all the components of what makes a great name and cool. long and un and forgettable is definitely not, those are not qualities. <laughs> but yeah. what's, what's amazing is that how quickly people forgot all about it because they never remembered it in the first place. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's interesting uh, because uh, Nike is actually an interesting example Coming from Israel, um, in Israel, we don't call it Nike. We call it Nike. And I'm not sure why. Yeah, uh, why is that? Nike. I have no idea. Huh. But um, there is that thing about different countries. And you, you, we talked about it in the beginning, how you move from different countries, where in different countries, the names will be pronounced differently. IKEA in, in Israel, and I think also in Sweden, is pronounced differently. It's not pronounced IKEA. It's pronounced EKEA. So there is like this uh, also a cultural thing in the area where the, the 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 name is coming to, as well as you need to be careful about uh, names or words that are have negative connotation mm -hmm. or swear words in different places. Right? Yes. Oh, so. I have a great example for you. So do you remember the Nova? Yeah, the car. But in Spanish, it means doesn't go. Nova. <laughs> <laughs> so they had to change the name. I mean, you know, this is this is such a great point because we, you know, we tend to be so English focused and mm -hmm. we forget that there are, you know, billions of people who do not speak English, right? But yeah. this where this is where the, the logo comes in because you can look at a Nike logo, the swoosh, and not even need the word Nike anymore. Well, it took them a while to get to that. Yeah, That's now, a funding. Yeah. yeah. Yes, that took millions and millions of dollars to do mm -hmm. that. Yes, mm -hmm. eventually. Well, that's like why I said that the logo is shorthand for your brand. If you have the right name and you have a logo that that can represent it um, in a graphic way, so that all I have to do is see it and instantly, you know, I, I connect with the whole experience, right? And by yeah. the way, you know, the swoosh is actually. Uh, a section of the wing of, of 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 the goddess of victory. That's what it was supposed to be. Oh, I did not know that. Okay, this is good. Yeah, yeah, I've read a lot about Nike because you know, for my book, I I did a lot of research. Yeah. Also, don't know if you know, but they they paid. I think um Steve Knight um I think that's the guy's name. Phil Knight. Yeah. Phil Knight. Yep. He, he was teaching at a, 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 a art school in Oregon, and one of the students he had one of his students do this. She got paid fifteen dollars. And 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 shares in Nike. <laughs> oh, nice! <laughs> Which now you know millions worth millions. So yeah, yeah sometimes it's worth it to do. Absolutely, this. <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> so yeah. before we get into like some steps or or rules for naming yeah. your product, another question I have is about in especially in 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 tech, uh, in digital products. Um, Many companies are trying to come up with some nonsense words that will become a name. Um, I don't know if Yahoo was like something like that. Uh, Google has a meaning, but most people don't know what the meaning is. Right. They know Google more than they know what the meaning of the word Google. But uh, there is a lot of those names that are just don't mean anything. And they do become or not uh, a brand name. And then everyone know what Yahoo is or whatever, right? So what's your thought about that? Well, first of all, let me let me say this. Um, the important thing about names are, so there's, um, I don't know if you know Marty Neumeyer, he's the author of The Brand Gap uh, and mm. Zag. He's um, he's like a, a real a brand guru and I quoted him quite a bit in my book. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. one of the things that, so he has seven, seven criteria. Uh, the first one is distinctive. So 
does it stand out in other names, you know, in, in, in your industry, in your, in your space. Um, mm -hmm. So that's important. It also has to be short because it's got to be easy to remember mm -hmm. and it has to fit the business. So, you know, and I'm trying to think of like, okay, so Facebook, Facebook, I think is a good example. And, you know, it used to be called the Facebook and mm -hmm. then, and then they, they dropped the, the, uh, if you watched, uh, Justin you know, Timberlake dropped uh, it, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah exactly um <laughs> and so so it has to be short and it's also got it's got to fit and it fit you know facebook fit because it fit what the purpose of of the um of the product was it also has to be easy to spell and pronounce and a lot of these names the reason that they fail is because it's not fun to say it that's the other thing he, um, Marty Neumeyer says, you know, it's got to have good mouth feel. Like when you say it, you smile or it just feels good to say it like Nike, you know, even Nike. I mean, you know, it's nice to say it doesn't feel, you know, and then it's got to, it's got to also have legs. Like, can you extend, extend on it? Like, can it, can you build a whole brand around it? And then the last one is it's got to be, you got to be able to trademark it. So those are the seven kind of the seven main components. The idea mm. of a nonsensical word, it can work, but the problem, at, do you have an example, Moshe? Because I, I can, you know, is there one in particular that stands Yeah, out? I don't know if Yahoo is um, is a nonsensical or not. I guess it's not. I mean, it, I mean yeah. what? it has a meaning. I yeah, mean. it does have a meaning, I guess. I've seen so many of those now, I don't have anything. Et, and Miro. Is, is Etsy? Miro? Et, Etsy? Et, Etsy? I don't oh, know, Etsy. Etsy. Yeah, Etsy. yeah, Etsy's a good one. It's fun, to, it's fun to say. It is fun. Yeah, it is kind of fun, fun to, say. to say. And yeah. also, it's like whether it ends on a consonant or a vowel and kind of how it, it's built. I mean, you know, you can you can break down a word in terms of like kind of how it all falls together when you say it. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's easy and fun to say. Yes. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I don't know, does Etsy have a meeting? I haven't looked that up. I don't know if it does or not. I, I, I've never heard of it. Yeah. anywhere else right mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but um, but you know like let's say let's, so airbnb is another one right so mm -hmm. it actually we used to the airbnb is actually short for what was originally um i think it was air breakfast bed and breakfast like yes that's right yeah, i think so yep and then they shortened to the airbnb but you know that's also fun to say and it mm -hmm. ends, you know, ending on consonants usually is nice, like Facebook, Airbnb, there's the, right? Um, but then you have Apple. So the thing with Apple, the reason I think it has really grown and 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 been sustainable since, you know, 1982, is that 1984 was the first Macintosh? I, I don't know if you know the story behind this, but um, it just so happens that um, apples were Steve Jobs' favorite fruit. That was really the reason he called it Apple. And mm -hmm. he named his first computer the Macintosh because Macintosh is the most popular <laughs> Apple in the United States. I'm learning all kinds of new things. I know. I'm like, am I, yeah. am I bursting your bubbles here about all No, this? no. It's, it's it blowing my mind because I'm, <laughs> I'm thinking even Apple, like if, if you think of something that everyone knows what an Apple is, yeah, that's something I, else that could really resonate with your branding. Like, oh, I just know. And, and, Fortunately, they, I mean, their logo is an apple, but but even the bite that's taken out of the apple. Yeah, they talk a lot about that, that it's Newton taking, you know, the apple falling, you know, all of that. And I think the original logo actually did have the tree, the apple with Newton underneath and, you know, the apple falling on his head, you know, the whole yeah. how he came up with the idea of gravity. That's, but that's how you can build around it. That goes that. Yes. that yeah. It has, cool a, about... story. It has yeah. a story. That, so that's the last thing I want to mention is having a story, not just you pick something out of the air, but it has a story that's meaningful to you. So, you know, Steve Jobs, you know, I mean, he, say what you will about the man, but he really was a genius. And certainly in terms of marketing, he was a marketing genius, but he, you know, it's he, what he wanted. Well, he, and of course the other Steve, I know people forget that there were two founders, uh, both named Steve, but, um, but mm -hmm. what's interesting about Apple is that it was very deliberate because, you know, you had, I mean, Microsoft, what does that mean? I, you know, I mean, does, do people like to say Microsoft? I mean, it doesn't have that. I, yeah. And, you know, it still feels like it's never going to be cool. It feels antiquated. You're right. I just watched the movie Blackberry 
about uh oh, the about Blackberry. oh my god that's such an amazing story i mean to go that is an amazing like, story exactly a leader to literally a dinosaur in such a short period of time yeah well that that's the flip side but the movie was about how they started and they you know their company name was rim research in motion and research in motion is you know a very like you know blah name rim is a bit better yeah, but it's just the acronym. And that happens a lot with companies that are just, they have long names and then they just abbreviate it and it becomes the name, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, IBM is a perfect example. International. Right, right, exactly. Uh, but here we are also talking about a very different generation, like more than 100 years ago and stuff like that. But <laughs> they never thought about like cool names over there back then. It was just, uh, you know, whatever. But um, and then they came up with the the phone, the BlackBerry, and the first designer for it, um, because of the keyboard and how it looks like those. I, I forget the the word in English for the the little sections in the BlackBerry. So that's why they decided to do, to name it BlackBerry. These days, Ring doesn't exist anymore, but the company name is BlackBerry. So so it's the same thing that's happened to Nike. Uh, not from valuation and from business perspective, but from <laughs> naming perspective. There, during m a activity, the best name is the one that wins. And mm -hmm. so, um, and I'm trying to think, I, it's going to come to me, but it's a financial uh, company. And when they were bought, um, they tried to, to change the name and they got so much, so much uh, mail or emails, right? Um yeah. People were so incensed that they had to keep they had to keep the original name. So, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. if I ever think of it, I'll I'll let you know. For sure, for sure. So, in in um, uh, going back to and and it's very cool that we're doing this one after the other these two episodes. But uh, going back to um, to Vitz, um episode, we did an exercise during the episode where we picked up uh, a product. The, her method of creating the story is by picking an object that uh, the product or the person or the company represents and then trying to find the essence of that um, specific yeah. item and from that creating the story. So we picked ChatGPT and the um, object that we picked up for that was a um, parachute that helped you learn how to dive like a tandem parachute. Um, Mine, because Matt and I are a bit different uh, about AI, mine was uh, with a person, so it's tandem with a person in it. Um, Matt was without a person, so it's just a machine that helps you. But it basically helped you uh, dive, right? Um, so if you would have, if you would have to take that, uh, and from that, you know, you can build a story about what ChatGPT is all about. Right, right. But let's say we want to, I don't know if ChatGPT is a good name or not. What, what's your, first of all, what's your opinion about that? Yeah. Well, it's memorable. Mm -hmm. People have no trouble remembering it. So it, it, it definitely checks off that box. The funny thing, when I was on my trip um, during the holidays in, um, I was uh, traveling from um, New Orleans to Tampa. And on the way, we stopped at uh, Pensacola Airport mm -hmm. and another airport because I, I had to go to find a new car for my rental, whatever, long story. And then I saw they have a, uh, a sign saying fly GPT. And I was like, what's going on here? Oh, and geez. yeah, and I was like, immediately I had this connotation to chat GPT. But then I realized the code name for that airport was GPT. And they were trying to have people flying through that airport. Wow. Yeah. Well, what? so what you're what you're <laughs> speaking to is the culture. And what happens is often that, that names kind of live out their usefulness. And once the world around them changes, the name no longer makes sense or they they have to adapt in some way. Yeah. Um, you know, Kodak is such a, a great example. So I don't know if you know this story. I, you know, you can tell, I mean, I've spent a lot of time thinking about <laughs> names and it's such a great story. So Kodak, this is, you know, I, I think this is true, but um, was actually the sound that the first shutter of the first camera made when you close it, it sounded like Kodak. Really? That's what that's <laughs> Kodak myth. Well, again, I'm not, you know, I can't validate this. I can't, you know. You weren't yeah. there to witness it. Yeah. Right. I was not there. It was, uh, you know, 1860s or something. You know, I don't think any of us were. No. But, no. but it's funny because even if we go through this exercise now of saying, should we rename ChatGPT? 
yeah. it's going to be a mute exercise because now everyone the you... the the name already is there in such a brand big brand name that nothing can replace that people will get upset if we we'll replace it even if it doesn't mean anything <laughs> You can't replace it once it's in. So Google is also a great example because Google is now we use it as a verb. It's in the Amer American dictionary. In the right. Mm -hmm. I mean, once you go, once you're in the dictionary, you're never leaving. Like this is the name. Right. And <laughs> yeah. so and, and it also is interesting because of what it means, you know, infinite uh, numbers, you know, the and and remember that Google replaced ask Jeeves was the that was yeah. the alternative right a butler right. I mean who thinks of this stuff right like yeah you know and and again it's it's also there's another piece to naming which is focus too much on today and not where we are going mm. so if you think about chat GPT has now become kind of shorthand for AI I mean that's remarkable. How long has mm -hmm. the name been around? Less than a year or a year. Less than a year. Yeah. I mean, but yet it, it's already... well in the public eye. I'm sure it was yeah. there before, but in the public yeah. eye. But yeah, in the public, I mean, to go from like zero recognition to being so ubiquitous that we, you know, we're. I'm sure it's going to turn in some kind of, and it's going to turn into a verb or a noun or whatever. You know, it's it's yeah. it has that kind. You know, talk about having legs. Yeah, and so. You know, and now we talk about we Google things, right? Like, but that's right. Yeah, I believe that the one of the reasons why Google has really worked in a way that Ask Jeeves never could is, first of all, it's so snooty, right? Because Jeeves was supposed to be a butler. It's like, OK, yeah. so right there, you've already and in America, that will never fly. Mm. <laughs> you know, yeah. it's just never going to fly. So. <laughs> So, um, so it's also, you kind of miss the mark and understanding your audience. Um, and then you don't think in terms of the future, like, you know, who could have imagined social media, you know, 50 years ago, it didn't exist. There was no internet, but there was a computer. Computers have been around since the 1940s. And, um, and so it's interesting that for me, names also have to be forward thinking. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah i like one of the criteria you mentioned about fun to say like i love ai but i don't like saying chat gpt yeah. and so I, I think they could have thought longer term but i don't think that they were really thinking about that like no well most people don't think at all about the name that's the problem yeah. and so yeah. what happens is sometimes they get lucky and it you know worms its way into the public consciousness and and it, it sticks and other times you have to change it I mean, blue yep. ribbon sports being a perfect example of that. You know, it's like you throw something together based on your own experience. And the problem with naming is how often we forget that we are not naming the the company for us, but for our future clients. Yeah. And so, yeah. the goal of the name is to help somebody understand what this is. Yeah. What you get, and often it's you know I like to break it down. It's either the the process or the outcome. And so, you know, with Nike, it's really about the outcome. Like, you know, we we basically, we help winners win. I mean, that's really what they're saying. Mm -hmm. and, and if you look at, you know, what's happened, you know, you have all these Olympic athletes and the more of them who are wearing the Nike logo, the more that becomes, you know, it's like, it's it's it sort of gets ingrained in our mind that this is, so when you buy Nike now, when you buy a piece of clothing that has the logo, even though you will never stand on any kind of any kind of podium you feel like a winner. in your life, yeah. you feel like you know, a winner. Yeah, you can feel like an athlete for you know the time you're wearing it because you yeah. made that. You know, I mean, that's really I think when the name becomes ingrained in the consciousness of yeah. the culture. So, so if you were in the shoes of, um, or if you were in in position to help ChatGPT yeah. come up with the name before they became a huge thing. What would be like, um, tell us like, what would be your process to, uh, quickly, what would be your process to sit down and, and come up with names and choose a name? So, so here's what, um, so this is actually, I have done this, right? So this is what we do, you do. You literally write a list of every word you can think of that sums up something about the experience of this app. I feel like they took the easy way out because it's chat speaking. I get that. But for me, 
the app is not about speaking. It's really about translating and doing it in, in like nanoseconds. It's like they take something that you're thinking or, you know, I mean, that it is very brilliant. And I have used it just to, to kind of help me brainstorm. Mm -hmm. So for me, like I would think of it in terms of a brainstorming tool. Mm -hmm. I would think, so once you make a list, right? And you and you literally you just do a brain dump. Once you do that, then you organize them in in columns. And so you'll have one that maybe is about translation, another one is about speaking, another one is about writing or what you know, what have you. And then you pick the best ones, the top three, and then you try them out. I would, you know, mm -hmm. I I wonder if they had any kind of focus group for this or if they even bothered. I, I'm assuming not. You know, it sounds like, right, they just kind of yeah. threw something together and they got lucky and it stuck. But right. I don't believe that it really explains what the heck this is. Mm -hmm. and, I, and they were a they were a closed company. This is before they went and got all the funding from Microsoft. So there's a whole backstory into like this was open AI in terms of it was not really meant to be monetized. Yeah. But the reason I'm asking the reason I'm asking this question is that most of us will not be Nike and most of us will not be ChatGPT. Right. So we need to be to learn from that history and not do what they're doing, even though we think that we might have a product that will be like theirs, and 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 be proactive about it and come up with that name that will help us get to where we want to do to get right so one of the things i have found and you know so i often go back i often work with a company after they've had the name for a while mm. and one of the things i have realized is that too often there's just way too many words and and because what people tend to do who are not well versed in this is they try to explain the name versus mm. getting a short it's like, it's really like a, a translation. It's like, it's, um, you know, like the Facebook for college students, you know, that's mm -hmm. what, that's how people think of it, right? Like they, they feel like they have to explain it. But the reality is when you're building it for future use, you need to believe that that's what the other things are going to do. Marketing is going to help you do that. The logo is going to help you do that. And eventually it's just the simplest way. It also is the easiest to remember. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so when you're saying um i have the list i put it in columns yeah. based on themes or whatever it is yeah and then i i pick the top three so picking those top three is is a really could be a gut feeling or just what i think no might no no, be the right one. no so this is the part i left out so okay and what you're doing is you list as many words two or three word sentences that are coming to mind when you mm -hmm. think of part of mm -hmm. I um I often uh, say to clients, you know, look at mythology, look at different languages, look at words that get translated <laughs> into other languages. Mm -hmm. And then you organize them into buckets, right? And then you come up with three names based on words from the bucket with the most words. Mm. So you have a group think and people, mm -hmm. you know, and you do it on post-it notes. This is the design thinking process, right? You put names like one word, one sentence, and you throw them up on a board and then you organize them into these buckets. And then we say, okay, we have one that's translation, one that's speaking and one that's writing, let's say. But translation is the one that has the most words under it. And so that's the, that's the area. And mm -hmm. then you narrow down into the words and then you take them on a test run and you see which one resonates. I see, I see. And what I have found, and this is such a fascinating <laughs> aspect of this process that the words you use to build the names the name are the words that people use to describe the name so yeah. it's like a 360 right and if you've done your if you've done it right people will literally give you back what you put in to come up with the name mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that's how you know it's a good name and i think that this also connects with what we talked with tovit about telling the story of your product mm -hmm. because the words can come from that story that's right. That's right. But you need to know the story. Yeah, you, you need to know the story. And more importantly, you need to understand how that story matters to your customer. Because mm -hmm. ultimately, yes, it's your story. But, you you know, as I said earlier, you're not speaking to yourself. So what you want is a story that resonates when people hear it. They're like, yeah, that's there's something that's almost instinctual, guttural, what have you, where people will respond because it resonates with them. Yeah. 
Well, we talked about a lot of things here, and <laughs> we definitely have a lot to think about. And um, um, this was really a, a great, a great chat, Orly. And uh, that process is, um, I, I hope, to our listeners, uh, it will give a bit of organization into when they need to pick up a name, how to do that. Uh, but um, I'm sure they can also reach out to you if they want to your help. How can people reach out to you? So ziwibrands.com, it's my website. Um, you can reach out to me on LinkedIn. And I also was going to say, when you go on my website, I have a um, a download, a free download of 10 personal brand tips. So it's right mm. there on the homepage. So so um, yeah, we can we can share that link also in the description. Yeah, of I, the yeah I have that, and I can, I'll send that. You know, I'll give that perfect. To you. And then <laughs> I'm also um, I am starting a series of workshops, and it's going to be three hours uh, once a week. Uh, this one will be only on elevator developing an elevator pitch. At the end of three hours, you will have a uh, memorable, actionable elevator pitch that will resonate with your target audience. And it's Perfect. called what's and it's called what's your pitch? What's and your pitch? I, I have I have the link to that as well, and that starts at the end of January. Excellent. And then give the name of your book as well. I know we talked right. about that so quite the name frequently. Of my book, right, is Ready Launch Brand: The Lean Marketing Guide for Startups. You can find it really anywhere where Excellent. they're sold. But if you awesome. go on Amazon, you can also see the. Um, I think I have fifteen five star reviews, something like that. Yeah. Um, hopefully and, more. Hopefully more soon. Yeah, hopefully. Well, my goal is to get a hundred. That's I'm really hoping to do that this year. But awesome. it was also uh, it came out. It was published in um, in May of 2021, and it was the new uh, new business book uh, release um, on Amazon in April. And Seth Godin endorsed it. That's amazing. That's I look amazing. forward to checking it out. Yeah. Do you talk in the book also about naming? Yeah, yeah. I have a whole chapter, and the chapter each chapter, like I said, it's connected to. Uh, it's connected to a marketing myth. So this one is called uh, Rose by Any Other Name. Mm -hmm. the, the one that, um, one of my favorites actually is, and I have a chapter called the Nike Syndrome. And then oh, uh, this one also is the gold standard word of mouth. And mm -hmm. and so how people think about word of mouth, because usually people say, well, I don't need marketing because I have word of mouth. So, right, 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 right. <laughs> awesome. Amazing, amazing. Uh, it's on my to read list already, so I'm definitely wanna, planning to read your book. Love, so, love, uh, yeah, love a review. Yeah, hopefully I will be one of the hundred. And uh, <laughs> thank you, I would love that. Thank you so much. I'd really absolutely, appreciate. absolutely. So, um, Matt, do you have any other questions? I mean, we could go on. I, this is this is fascinating. Yeah. I, I mean, I love talking about this stuff, and <laughs> uh, so I look forward to checking the book out. And Orly, thank you so much for coming on the show. Uh, thank Moshe, thank you as always. My Absolutely. Pleasure. Thank you so much, Orly. That was a pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you to all the fans. We'll talk to you next time. Take care, everyone. Thank you to all the listeners. We really appreciate the feedback and support. Please leave us a review to help others find the show on Apple or Spotify or anywhere else you're listening to the show.